It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Lenore Knutson. Lenore Knutson's career has been shaped by diverse professional opportunities. After earning a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in education, she became a nationally certified school psychologist working with school teams, parents, and children. Dr. Or Ms. Knutson later attended law school and she now combines school psychology and special education law, dispute resolution, the work of special education teams, and building personal capacity in special education disciplines. Currently, Ms. Knudsen's career has culminated in a rich blend of issues focusing on education and dispute resolution. She serves as a special education mediator, compliant investigator, and hearing officer in several states. Ms. Knudsen provides professional development in education and dispute resolution and speaks to audiences across the nation. In 2012, Ms. Knudsen joined with Stephanie Weaver to create Pangora Consulting LLC, offering an array of services focusing on education, dispute resolution, systems building, and legal compliance. I can honestly tell you, Wyoming has been very blessed to work with Lenore for the last 15 years, and I am myself and very excited to gain further insight and expertise from her and her knowledge, and I know you will be as well. It is now my honor to turn the time over to Ms. Lenore Knudsen. Uh, thank you, Dina. That's a very kind introduction. And I am the one that has been privileged by uh, working with Wyoming all these years. I've developed deep friendships and connections, and I'm proud to say that my son is now a senior at the University of Wyoming as well. So you're stuck with me. Uh, we do have a, an interesting topic today. We presented this topic in different formats to school psychologists and also um, I think uh, special educators. I'm not sure who the other one was, but uh, this is the third round and it's um, a little bit different each time because it gives us an opportunity to tailor the information to the respective disciplines. We have a lot of people on the line, but I very much hope that this is going to be participatory for all of you. It's much better if we work together as we move through the materials. So you have a couple of options. You can certainly use the chat and Dina has agreed to help me um, monitor the chat. And so we'll hopefully catch your questions in real time. You can also feel free to unmute your mic and shout out if that's possible. Um, and uh, also raise your little Zoom hand. Um, we know we have several people joining from the same room, so just be mindful of noise and what's happening in your background, but please don't let that discourage your, your participation in any way. Um, so in anticipation of today, you have, um, I think, three handouts that, boom, just like that, I say it and Dina does it. <laughs> That's amazing. She was doing it before I said it, by the way. Um, so there's three handouts in the chat box um, and, and they're based on the five tips and five drawbacks or concerns um, model. So you'll see five tips for child find, five tips for IDEA discipline, and five tips for IDEA uh, implementation. Um, and on the reverse side, there's some lessons learned kind of information as well. So you're free to use those at, uh, in whatever way might be helpful to you. And then uh, closer to the end of the session today, you'll also get a copy of the presentation um, for your purposes. Uh, it is recorded, so you have the option of listening to it at a future point as well. So with that said, I am anxious to get into the content for today and see uh, if we can drum up some good questions. Um, first of all, it is my hope and expectation that we would all consider ourselves lifelong learners. It's one of the reasons we're in education um, and, and so one of the ways that we improve outcomes for kids with disabilities is to really lean into the process and challenge ourselves. So that's what I'm gonna ask you to do today, lean in. We have some topics, we're gonna to talk about teamwork um, and that is going to lead off our discussion because it's so critically important. Team sharing, accountability, making better decisions, less blame, and most importantly, better outcomes. Um, I'm also, uh, I think pretty thrilled to say that uh, I did a work group really earlier today. It was a national work group of complaint investigators and uh, we moved through some relevant cases, recent cases in that work group. And two of the decisions talked about 
um, the importance of making team decisions when it comes to uh, designing evaluations and designing IEPs. So courts are really paying attention to this concept of team decision making as well. Uh, and we'll hit that straight off and really emphasize it. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about aligning services to needs, making sure that services are based on needs. Um, and that is followed by a period, end of story. Services must be based on individual needs of the student. Um, we'll talk about how to do that. And then providing services consistent with the IEP. Um, you'll hear me repeat over and over again, no freestyling. And by freestyling, I mean, you don't get to make unilateral decisions. Those are team decisions. Again, followed by period, no other discussion about that. And then educational benefit. Um, and by that, we mean FAPE, progress, including behavior too, uh, what is reasonable, what is meaningful. And finally, we're gonna wrap up with how will you know it when you see it? Um, we're gonna talk about the IEP, progress monitoring, what to do with stagnant progress, what to do with unexpected progress. So all of that being said, here we go. First, some comments about teamwork. Um, decisions must be made by a team, right? Teams share input and teams also share responsibility. Uh, I am not, well, let me put it this way. You won't hear me compliment the United States Department of Education and OSEP very often, but this is one way that I think they got it right. Um, vesting decisions in teams was absolutely brilliant for several reasons. One is better decisions are made with that collective input. Um, to the shared responsibility that comes with teamwork ups all of our game. We're all better because of it. Three is that shared responsibility also means shared blame at the end. There's no one particular person. If if parents become frustrated with the team or frustrated with the school district, there's no one particular person that's gonna shoulder all of that blame. Um, so it's vested in the team and, and the team is there to support each other as well. And lastly, the very best reason I can tell you is because making team decisions with multiple sources of input means you have better outcomes for kids with disabilities. Let's talk for just a moment about mandatory team membership. And because this presentation is directed at OTs, PTs, and behavior intervention specialists, specialists I think it's especially important to walk through these. Um, so first of all, parents are always invited, right? Always invited. That does not elevate them to mandatory team membership. And that seems a little odd. I'm gonna tell you why. So hang on to that thought. Mandatory members include not less than one regular education teacher of the child, not less than one special education teacher of the child. And there's some small exceptions there, but I'm giving you the broad general rule. A representative of the public agency who's qualified to provide and supervise specially designed instruction is knowledgeable about the general education curriculum and knowledgeable about the resources of the agency. And an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. This is all pursuant to 300.321. As we think about who the mandatory members are, that, that holds special significance because mandatory team members must be present in whole or in part unless they're excused and the excusal provisions change depending on whether your particular area of expertise is going to be discussed at a team meeting or not but no generally the rule is mandatory team members must be present in whole if they're going to be present in part the excusal provisions must be utilized so not less than one regular education teacher of the child, unless the child is not going to be participating in regular education at all, which should be very rare. The regular education teacher is mandatory because IEPs are aligned to state standards. IEPs align with the general curriculum. We're gonna talk some more about that. Goals align with the general curriculum. FAPE is tied to the general curriculum. And who is the expert in a public school system in the general curriculum, it's the regular education teacher. So 
mandatory member, critically important. And I think over the years, we have not really communicated to the regular education teacher how important they actually are in the special education process. Not less than one special education teacher of the child. And again, the um, mandatory member is the teacher. If a child only has a provider, for instance, in the state of Wyoming, speech language could be the special education service that's provided when speech language is the only service provided and the only area of eligibility. So in that case, there may not be a special education teacher, but there would certainly be a special education provider, the speech language clinician. Again, teachers, the general rule, a provider is the fallback and only if there's no teacher available or involved. And then I wanna skip down to an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. Know that the IDEA does not intend for that to be the professional that administered each assessment, okay? So broadly, generally, uh, who can interpret instructional implications of evaluation results? It's typically the special education teacher on the team. Um, school psychologists are not required members, OTs are not required members, PTs are not required members, and behavior intervention specialists are not required members. Uh, an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results could very well be the special education teacher. One final note about mandatory team membership is that it is up to the school or the district within which the school operates to um, assign their resources and dedicate their resources. So as long as they meet the mandatory team membership, um, there would be no violation of IDEA if the district said, okay, itinerant folks, we are not going to have you attend these IEP team meetings uh, because your caseloads are full and you need to be serving students and we have a shortage of OTs or PTs, whatever the logic might be. Districts are free to do that. They can dedicate their resources as long as they meet the mandatory team membership. Anyone have any heartburn over what I just told you? Any questions about that? Okay, so in summary, in most cases, related service providers are not mandatory team members. And beyond the mandatory membership, again, districts have the authority to allocate their resources. Parents are not mandatory members in the same sense that those team members are. Parents are always, always, always invited, okay? But parents can opt out of the IEP team process. Over the course of my career, which spans decades, I have seen it happen when, for instance, sometimes parents are incarcerated and their participation is not something they're able to do or interested in doing at that point. Even an incarcerated parent has the right to attend, um, but sometimes getting someone on the phone in a prison system can be quite difficult. Um, so there may be times when a parent says, go ahead without me, that incarcerated parent. Um, also, there are times when parents are laboring under their own issues, like chemical dependency, where they may be invited to attend but they're just simply not able to marshal their own resources and participate at that point in time. With sufficient documentation, the school could and should proceed without the parent in very, very limited circumstances. But know that there are times when the IEP team decision-making must take place, even if a parent isn't present. Again, involve your, uh, go up your food chain, involve your directors, your, your coordinators, your case managers, whoever it might be, and make sure that you've done everything you can to try and to convince the parent to attend. That is the language in the regulations. If you are unable to convince the parent to attend, then in limited circumstances, you can go forward with sufficient documentation without the parent. Um, if you haven't included, if you haven't made those efforts to include the parents in the decision-making process, the IEP team process, the more likely they are to dispute your decision. So it's another way where lean in applies in special education. You wanna lean in and really the more frustrated that a parent gets, the more difficult a parent gets, you wanna lean in even more and make sure that you include that parent, okay? So do not, 
don't, under any circumstances, exclude parents from the decision-making process. Don't make unilateral changes to the IEP services. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But you have no authority as an individual to change IEP services. The only uh, authority comes in one of two ways. One is it's the entire team at the annual IEP team meeting, or it could be the parent and the school. The school is not necessarily an individual or a single person, okay? The parent and the school can agree to make changes to the IEP, but you could never do that on your own without the agreement of the parent. And don't, don't underestimate the importance of prior written notice because that is how you document the good work of the team. Courts will look to prior written notice to say, has this parent been included? Has the parent's concerns been considered in this process? Um, what other options have been considered other than what the team is proposing? Uh, you want to make sure that you document the good work of the team in artfully drafted prior written notice. Just a moment of pause here for the purpose of talking about a COVID overlay. So I, I can honestly tell you, when we started talking about a pandemic back in March of 2020, I never thought we would still be talking about a pandemic in November of 21, never occurred to me. But here we are today and it still has import and meaning. Um, so the one thing I can tell you with certainty, 100% certainty, is that FAPE is still FAPE. As the guidance rolled out starting in March and April of 2020, all the way up through September and October of 21, when we received our most recent roadmap guidance, I can tell you that Congress and the United States Department of Education has clarified over and over again that FAPE is still FAPE. FAPE is based on individual students' needs and FAPE is delivered in the least restrictive environment. COVID has not changed that. Does it look a little different? Maybe. Does it feel a little different? Maybe. But the same, same decision making, team decision making exists, and you must provide services consistent with the IEP. If you haven't revised the IEP to amend uh, due to COVID um, based on the student's now current educational needs, you are required to implement the full IEP. Right? You go through the same steps. You base an IEP on the student's unique individual needs and you implement consistent with the IEP. All the way back in April of 2020, the United States Department of Education, then Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, said we are requesting no waivers of any requirements of IDEA or Section 504. Most notably, we're not requesting a waiver to FAPE in the LRE. So we knew back in April of 2020 that there were no waivers requested. We didn't quite know what to do about that information, but we had that information way back then. Okay, there's been a series of guidance letters, just again, reemphasizing and making it clear, OSERS, which is the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, again, made clear, no IDEA requirements are waived. And letters to special education and early intervention partners, same thing. No IDEA requirements are waived. SEAs and LEAs remain responsible, responsible for ensuring the provision of FAPE to all children with disabilities. So you're getting the sense here, FAPE is still FAPE. What is FAPE? We rely on two major cases, two landmark cases from the United States Supreme Court to help us define what FAPE is. Um, and, and here's the first one, okay? Educational program must be appropriately ambitious in light of the student's unique circumstances, just as advancement from grade to grade is appropriately ambitious for most children in a regular classroom. The goals may differ, but every child should have the chance to meet challenging objectives. So we still have the same, the identical same obligation to comprehensively evaluate in order to be able to propose FAPE for every eligible student with a disability, right? We know that for students who do not participate in general education classroom, we lose that measure of how's the child doing on those curriculum-based, classroom-based measures, state and district-wide assessments, 
And for students that may be working to alternate standards, who may be outside of the regular classroom where those regular measures of progress don't take place, then we have to really focus, according to Andrew F., on making sure that the IEP is sufficiently ambitious in light of the student's unique educational needs. Just by way of perspective, Andrew F. was a little boy with autism who did not regularly participate in a general classroom environment. And the parents became very frustrated with the lack of measure regarding how this child was making progress and ultimately enrolled the student in a private placement and then sought tuition reimbursement from the district. They prevailed at the United States Supreme Court level. So it's important to note that they did not prevail at every level up to that point. Uh, and the United States Supreme Court said, mm -mm, it cannot be such a minimum or minimal expectation. It has to be more than de minimis. Okay. And that enter F is in conjunction with, with the long standing Supreme Court case of the Raleigh uh, standard. And Raleigh essentially stands for the premise that if you develop IEPs according to the procedure set out in IDEA, um, and the IEP represents a reasonable, an opportunity for reasonable educational benefit, then that will be held to be FAPE. Uh, it is based on a reasonableness standard and does not um, necessarily look to maximize a student's performance, okay? There are many places, and as you work as an OT, a PT, behavior intervention specialist, there are many, many places where our work aligns to the general curriculum. I'm gonna point out just a few of them. Okay, if you are providing specially designed instruction, um, could be in the area of behavior, adapting as appropriate to the needs, excuse me, let me back up here, um, means adapting as appropriate to the needs of an eligible child, the content, methodology, or delivery of instruction to address the unique needs that result from the disability. And it's this bold part that I wanna really bring to your attention to ensure access of the child to the general curriculum. We know that the general curriculum means the same curriculum as for non-disabled children, because the regulations tell us that. So our job in special education is to help that student to benefit from the general curriculum. And that means there are multiple ways, whether you're an OT or a PT or behavior intervention specialist, then you can, you can help that child to benefit from and make progress in the general education curriculum. Some more points of alignment for you. Let's see. The IEP must include a statement of how the child's disability affects the child's involvement in and progress in the general curriculum. Involvement and progress in the general curriculum. Incredibly important, right? The IEP must include a description of the special education and related services to enable the child to be involved in and make progress in the general curriculum. So, in most instances, OT and PT, in fact, I can hardly think of an exception to this, but OT and PT are going to be related services in the state of Wyoming. That means your role is still to help the child be involved in and make progress in the general curriculum. And as we look at the definition of related services, it's going to link directly to their specially designed instruction. Okay, the clear implication in all of this is that education, an education curriculum that is applicable to all children and that is based on the state's academic content standards is what every student with a disability has the right to be involved in and make progress in to the extent that it's appropriate. So Special education back in the day that I was a school psychologist, which is a long time ago, we called it public law 94, 142 back then. Back in that day, special education was, first of all, just talking about inclusion, just beginning to include uh, students with significant disabilities in a regular school setting, not quite introducing them into the general cl classroom yet, but it was coming. Um, we 
really operated as a parallel universe. Kids were pulled into special education because we were protecting them. We were wanting to ensure their success. And we did it in a parallel curriculum in a parallel universe. Those days are gone. We're looking at closing the achievement gap and tying all special education and related services to the general curriculum to the extent that it's appropriate. And we know, we know because our funding is based on it, our assurances are based on it, there should be a very small percentage of students that are not working in the general curriculum. Very small. Very small percentage of students that are not assessed in the general curriculum through district and statewide assessments. Okay. This is a right that students have, and it's a duty, an obligation that school districts have. It all starts with this. I'm a visual learner, so I have all these visual images rolling around in my head of how to um, explain these concepts, these legal and compliance concepts. And one is the FAPE continuum. Everything starts there, and this is the work of the team. This is what a team does. So go all the way back to the beginning, and it starts with a comprehensive evaluation. By the way, every evaluation under the IDEA is intended to be a comprehensive evaluation that looks at the whole child. I continually, and I would say pretty routinely, see serial evaluations. Well, we evaluated this little piece, and now we need more information, so we're gonna evaluate this little piece, and now we need more information, and the student isn't really making the progress that we'd hoped for, so now we're gonna evaluate sensory and go on and on. That is not the scheme that the IDEA anticipates. The IDEA anticipates and requires a comprehensive evaluation. Now, I am not suggesting to you that you have to go test in every area, every time. So don't leave here and say that Lenore said we had to go conduct an assessment in every single area. That is not what I'm saying to you. What I'm saying is you have to look at the whole child and determine what areas need additional assessments. And it starts with a review of already existing information and data. What do we know? Schools collect a plethora of data. What do we know about this child? Their level of functioning, their difficulties, their skills, concerns of the parents, all of that. What do we know? And then we probe to say, what other areas do we need information in, in order to be able to answer our questions of what is the student's eligibility and what are their educational needs? Put another way, what are the contents of this student's IEP, right? That's comprehensive evaluation. And then you move on once you've comprehensively evaluated. By the way, this could be a comprehensive re-evaluation as well, but it's always comprehensive because it's the work of a team, not one individual saying, well, I think we need to go test here, or I think we need some sensory information now. This is the work of the team. So the team decides and probes and looks at the whole child. Once you have comprehensively evaluated or reevaluated this child, you move on to present levels, right? And by the way, um, present levels is going to be an annual requirement. Each year, you still start with that comprehensive evaluation and then layer in the data that has been collected over the last year to say, okay, now what are the present levels of this student? But you never leave that comprehensive evaluation until you conduct another one. You incorporate that information in. It helps us establish where the student has been over the course of three years and where they need to go. You, you get to present levels and, and needs, educational needs across environments, across environments, okay? And from there, you identify skill gaps, okay? This is where the student's skills currently are. This is what we expect of this age level, and there's a gap here. That's where you target measurable goals, okay? And from there, you design services and supports. What services and supports does the student need in order to make progress in their measurable goals, their reasonable but rigorous measurable goals? All of those services, that bundle of services gets delivered in the least restrictive environment. And through that process, you should and must be able to document educational benefit or the efforts that you've gone back to recalibrate why you haven't gotten the educational benefit you anticipated. 
So that must also be documented. You either document that educational benefit consistent with what you have documented in the IEP, or you go back and you problem solve through this process again, right? If you have lack of educational benefit, you got a big problem and the team needs to pay attention to it. So one more time briefly, you're gonna start over on the left at comprehensive evaluation. You're gonna look at the whole child. You're gonna understand the student's present levels through this process. And then you're gonna translate that to now current educational needs. From there, you're gonna develop rigorous but reasonable measurable annual goals. Again, what are those skill gaps? And then you're gonna design services and supports and implement those services consistent with the IEP and document, document, document. This least restrictive environment component is a mandate, right? It is the only time in the regulations you're gonna read the word maximum. There are three maximums associated with least restrictive environment. It is an absolute mandate, it is not optional. And then you get over here to educational benefit, which means progress. We're gonna go through those in some detail. These are the same steps laid out a little bit differently. And as we move through those, I want you to envision a link, a physical link between each one of those and sort of this click sound, this linking sound like train cars coming together. Evaluation links to present levels. Present levels linked to measurable goals. Measurable goals linked to services and supports, so on and so on. The critical nature of those links means that if you get over to educational benefit and the student isn't making progress in the way that the IEP team anticipated, that means you have a broken link and you've got to go backwards to figure out, is it because we need more evaluative data because the student's educational needs were maybe never, never fully known or maybe they've changed? Or is it because the student's present levels have changed? Or is it because their goals haven't been implemented? You have got a broken link if you have lack of progress. The documentation that I'm talking about, the, the going back and figuring out what to do next comes from finding that broken link, right? Again, it all starts with a comprehensive evaluation. And an evaluation under the IDEA serves two purposes. One is identifying the student who needs specially designed instruction and related services because of an IDEA disability, All right? We're pretty good at that. And Wyoming has criteria that they use and say, okay, you collect your evaluative information to be able to say, is this an eligible student on the initial evaluation? The dialogue changes just a little bit on a reevaluation because the student doesn't need to re-meet eligibility criteria on that reevaluation. The, the comprehensive data that's collected through a comprehensive evaluation must support that the student continues to be eligible. That's the language in the regulation, right? Meet eligibility criteria and continues to be eligible. But this is connected by an and, which means that both must be present. So helping IEP teams identify special ed and related services that the student requires. That's the contents of the student's IEP. That's educational needs, right? Two purposes to an evaluation. If you're only evaluating for one, it's not enough. So if you're only evaluating to determine eligibility and you're not going deep enough to identify the special education needs of the student, you have missed an opportunity and you have a broken link. That is a compliance issue. Going back to the work group that I conducted this morning um, for about 20 states that were on the line, um, we had a couple cases that dealt with this two-prong analysis and, and courts nail it every time. If you have a student who is IDEA eligible but does not need specially designed instruction, guess what? That is not an eligible student under IDEA. So let me say that again, because I, I think I may have misspoke there a little bit. If you have a student who meets eligibility criteria for a disability category, but does not have the corresponding need for specially designed instruction, that student is not eligible under IDEA, okay? 
And let me back up for just a second, because I want to point out that I'm using a, a citation here from the commentary to the federal regulations, and it's 71 Federal Register, and then this long number is a page number. So if you went to 71 of the Federal Register and pulled out this page number, it would give you this specific information, All right? The commentary is very important to our understanding of the federal regulations. How do you plan a comprehensive evaluation? This is it right here. I think of it as circular, not linear. Now, I know that over the course of the years, because it's shocking to hear this, but as uh, Dina said, I've been a consultant with the Department of Education now for over 15 years. In that 15 years, I've seen a lot of changes and I've seen a lot of growth. But one thing that I have continued to see intermittently is the use of this rubric where you know you enter a certain disability category and then across the top it has what assessments are required that rubric was taken out of wde's forms years ago for a reason it was taken out of wde's forms because decisions regarding what assessments need to be conducted are based on this the student not a rubric that says these are mandatory. So when you have a student that you're looking at, okay, we've ex reviewed existing data, we continue to have, and we're gonna probe these areas to find what areas we continue to have evaluative questions that are unanswered. So health, vision, or hearing might be one of them. If you have a student that has not passed their vision or hearing screening, it is absolutely critical that you incorporate that into an evaluation plan, right? If a parent has taken that child to an audiologist or an ophthalmologist and provides you with already existing data, no problem. You don't have to repeat that. You can consider already existing data, but it is really problematic to go ahead and evaluate a student using assessments that require vision or hearing when you're not sure that the child is seeing or hearing appropriately, right? So when you have a student who's failing vision or hearing screening, you got to dig deeper here and you got some probing to do to find out if you also need to conduct evaluations in that area. And make no mistake, for the purposes of eligibility determinations and the contents of the child's IEP, it is absolutely the public agency's responsibility to collect that information, all right? Even if it means seeking outside assessments from an ophthalmologist or an audiologist. You must probe in that area if you have unanswered questions. It is the team's job to develop a plan to get those answers. And then you're gonna look at cognitive abilities. And then you're gonna look at academic skills and communication and social, emotional and functional and physical motor. Not that you're planning assessments in these areas. It's a probing question model. What questions do you have remaining when you probe these areas after considering all already existing data? So the very best example I can give is from my professional life um, at, some point in my school psychology career, I decided to leave the public school system and go into the private sector and share my home with six profoundly disabled young adults. These young adults had grown up in the state hospital system and had significant cognitive impairments uh, and behavioral difficulties. So they were all in full headgear due to injurious behavior behavior that injured themselves and others. They were missing eyes, lips, fingers. They were extremely aggressive young adults, right? All six of them come to live with me 24 seven, by the way. And um, one of the young uh, women that lived with me um, was also diagnosed as profoundly deaf, okay? This young person, I started to suspect shortly after living with her that she had some hearing. I wasn't sure how much, but there were things that's, that we would talk about and she would show up with her coat. So if we talked about going out to eat, boom, she's at the door with her coat. If we talked about going to McDonald's or any kind of fast food, she showed up at the door with these little pick sims, which by the way, she never knew used 
she knew that it got her a trip to McDonald's or Burger King or something like that. So I started to suspect that she had some pretty good hearing. When we ultimately did this kind of probing and said, I have questions about her hearing level, we were able to get that evaluated and lo and behold, her hearing was normal. She had developed behaviors over the years that had allowed her to tune out and appear to be deaf because she wasn't necessarily interested in what we were saying. Also, in fairness, she was also an extreme headbanger. So she had a lot of calcification on her face and had a lot of injury to this area of her body. So it's, it's you know, it, it just seemed to make sense that, okay, she doesn't pay attention and she has all this injury, so she's not hearing us. But nobody ever looked at the whole person. And when you do that, you get different responses. You get different questions that you have to answer. So I see we have a question in the chat or comment, so I'm going to read it. Hearing and access to an audiologist can often be difficult. It may take several weeks to months to get appointments. This would uh, then exceed the 60 days to determine eligibility. And uh, what do you recommend in terms of proceeding? First of all, keep in mind that you're doing this probing question analysis before you ever propose and obtain consent for an evaluation. So you're not midway through the 60 days when you find out you have vision or hearing concerns. You're prior to the 60 days because this is what you're doing to propose an evaluation. And if you have unanswered evaluative questions, then you, you put that into an artfully drafted evaluation plan accompanied by an artfully drafted prior written notice, and then you seek the parent's informed consent. So first of all, in terms of timing, you have the full 60 days. Second of all, um, I have learned over the years working in many different states that Wyoming has a resource that few other states have, and that is the outreach program for vision and hearing. So if you have concerns regarding a student's hearing, questions regarding a student's hearing or their vision, my very first recommendation is to contact outreach. They can help get you connected. And I saw earlier, based on um, the names flashing on the screen, when people entered the room today, I saw a couple people from Outreach on there. So I would like to ask them any suggestions that you can give your colleagues for making sure that th these questions get answered in a timely way. Anyone? Hey, Lenny, it's Billy. Can you hear me? I can, Billy. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm on my headphones. Yes, I would say that we definitely have connections for deaf, hard of hearing. We also have our newborn screening program. So oftentimes we can trace back through uh, newborn screenings and child development screenings, uh, just what the history of the child is. And so with those connections, are you able to help teams get evaluation sources that could be timely in a comprehensive evaluation? We do our best, and most of the time, we're very successful. Thank you, Billy. That's you're welcome. That the confidence that this can be done in that time frame. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning outreach. We love our job. <laughs> yeah, I hope that answered the question of the per person um, that asked it. You know, we aren't talking in absolutes here because there can always be a circumstance where you might have a, a rock star evaluation set up and the student gets ill or something and you got to start again. But, you know, the IDEA is set up to meet the needs of the student. And if something like that happens, then, you know, you look at um, what evaluation information do we have? Can we move forward with what we have? Why we continue to evaluate? Or do we need to um, sort of get some kind of emergency intervention here um, in terms of the parent concurring with some kind of extension, which could only ever happen in exigent kinds of circumstances, uh, because the requirement in Wyoming is that that evaluation would be completed in 60 days. Um, and, and I have worked with vision outreach as well, um, and, and they have resources. So your very first call when you are suspecting this should be to outreach. Right? 
So anyhow, you get the idea here. You're going around and probing. And only if you have unanswered evaluative questions, then do you put that area into a proposal to evaluate, along with an artfully drafted prior written notice, and then you seek the parent's consent. Any questions about this evaluation wheel? It will be in your materials, but I believe it's already on WDE's website, or it used to be, anyhow. Right? I want to emphasize this one more time. IDEA eligibility, comprehensive evaluation that will give you information sufficient to determine does this student have an IDEA eligibility according to Wyoming's criteria? You don't get to vary from that. And then these are connected by an and. Um, and so the other one is the educational needs. You must comprehensively evaluate for both. Because if you don't have both at the conclusion of your evaluation, you don't have an IDEA eligible child. Again, it's entirely possible. I'm not going to say it's frequent, but it's entirely possible to have a disability, but no educational need. And therefore, you would not be an IDEA eligible student. That student would never cross IDEA's threshold. How can I say that? Because that's what the regulations say. If the disability does not adversely affect educational performance, the student is not eligible under IDEA. You can go straight to 300.8 and read that language. Okay. It goes on to say if the child does not need special education or specially designed instruction, the child is not eligible under IDEA. This is critical. If a child only needs a related service like OT, PT, or counseling, some related service that is not an eligible child under IDEA, right? Even at the very early ages, and I know that that can be difficult, particularly for preschool students as you're fleshing out what is the primary area of concern, but Part B pertains to preschool as much as it pertains to K through 12 and beyond. So again, if you don't have an IDEA disability and the need for specially designed instruction, that student does not cross the threshold into IDEA eligibility. Okay, any questions about that? And you can feel free to put them in the chat. You can feel free to raise your little Zoom hand, whatever it might take. All right, you ready to move on then to present levels? We've looked at comprehensive evaluations, how to design them, how to propose them, how to get consent. Now we're gonna to go to present levels. We're gonna assume that you have conducted a rock star comprehensive evaluation. Again, if you are in a situation where you're conducting serial evaluations, you have a problem. You have a comprehensive evaluation problem. And yes, it is a compliance issue. If you're monitored or there's a complaint filed, that will be a violation of the requirement to conduct a comprehensive evaluation. Okay, um, when it comes to OT and PT kinds of evaluations, and, and, the, and that's not an exhaustive list, but because we're directing this presentation to OT and PT today, I also want to point out that there are no eligibility criteria for OT or PT. You may conduct assessments for that second prong. What are the educational needs of a child? But you would not conduct assessments for eligibility scores. There are no scores when it comes to qualifying for OT or PT services. The bottom line is, does the student need that service in order to benefit from their specially designed instruction? Because that is the definition in 300.34, right? So now let's assume you got a rock star evaluation, you're ready to move on to present levels. And this is more than just test scores. In your present levels, it is insufficient to simply regurgitate test scores, okay? You have to explain the levels of academic achievement and functional performance. Ask, probe, what skills does the student currently have? What difficulties does the student currently have? How do they function across environments? How does the student perform throughout the school day, right? And for our intents and purposes, this is really more about the school day than functioning in a community. 
until you get up to transition age students. And then we have separate kinds of inquiries that we need to make in terms of transition assessments to determine their functioning in the community. How does this disability affect the students? How does the student's disability affect his or her involvement in the general education curriculum? Okay. Again, it must be linked to the general education curriculum unless the student is taking alternate assessments aligned to alternate standards. And then we're talking about a significant downward extension, but those should be very, very few students. Oops, I accidentally paused my screen sharing. I apologize for that. So it looks something like this. When you're working as a team and you're collecting this information and you're reviewing it as a team, you've got present levels of academic achievement and functional performance that are descriptive and rich and are, are relevant across environments, okay? And from those present levels then, which by the way, are compared to the general curriculum. It's compared to the general curriculum because that's what the law says. You're not free to develop present levels that compare to anything else, unless it's preschool population and then it's appropriate preschool activities, okay? But it is absolutely tied to what do we expect other kids to be doing? From there, you're gonna get these skill gaps, right? You're gonna measure, this is the student's current level, this is the expectation. And these skill gaps are compared to the standards. What do we expect for a student of this age? When you compare present levels to skill gaps, now you get to the point where you're understanding where do we need to target IEP goals? And these goals are what get individualized, they're unique, for every student, okay? Present levels, describe the student compared to the general curriculum across environments. The skill gaps are what you discover through comprehensive evaluation compared to what you expect kids to do. And the IEP goals then are unique for every student. Right? Goals link to skill gaps. Annual measurable goals must be based on unique needs the student and designed to help the student to be successful in the general curriculum. Right? Rigorous but reasonable. I want you to remember those two words, jot them on a piece of paper, put them on a sticky note, put them up on a wall, something rigorous but reasonable, because that's our target for when for planning measurable annual goals. Rigorous, meaning challenging and targeted for this student and reasonable meaning attainable within a year. That's what we're writing goals for is a year. Unless you have a student who's aligned to alternate standards, in which case you're also going to have benchmarks, not in place of the annual goal, but in addition to the annual goal. Okay, what about behavior? Since we have behavior intervention specialists on the line today. I can tell you based on my observations, that we've gotten pretty good at that analysis of present level skill gap and then targeting those measurable annual goals unique to the student's needs when it comes to academics and even some functional performance like life skills. Where we have not ca caught up is in the area of behavior. Somehow it becomes more difficult. And I suspect that it's because A, we aren't as, as um, learned about behavior. We haven't had as much experience about it. It's not taught to the same degree in teacher preparation programs uh, as academics. And also because we have this other system of removals that address challenging behavior. And when we look at our toolbox, the first line tool being removal, then we tend to go to that instead of really looking at what is it about this behavior that interferes with learning, okay? Because if you check that yes on the IEP, the section of the IEP that is consideration of special factors in Wyoming, if you check that yes, the IEP must address behavior. How do they do that? How does the IEP team do that? It could be through developing behavioral goals. 
It could be through developing a behavior intervention plan. It could be through conducting a functional behavioral assessment and then developing behavioral goals or a behavior intervention plan or both. Okay. Could be through additional related services like counseling, uh, BCBAs, behavior intervention services, whatever it might be. But you can use behavioral goals or behavior interventions to improve a student's behavior and help close that skill gap. You absolutely have that obligation as an IEP team when behavior interferes with learning. Okay. Hey, Lenore. Yes. We do have a question and it's that's concerning skill gaps for PT. It says, would we pri look primarily at PE standards, standardized testing, meaning the, BO the BOT2, or a combination of both? Um, I would say neither, because when we're talking about those skill gaps, and I want to back up a couple slides, we're talking about the students performance in the general curriculum compared to what we expect in our state standards. What do we expect a student of this age to be able to do? What do we expect a student of this grade to be able to do? And then we target our IEP goals. So when you're looking for skill gaps, the question is a little bit different for PT or other related services because you're looking at what does the student need in order to benefit from their specially designed instruction? when you're talking about related services. So you're taking a skill gap that's been identified and it could be something like uh, motor skills. It could be strength, stamina, it could be fine motor skills for OTs. It could be any number of things. And, and if the team determines that those are related services are necessary in order for the student to benefit from their specially designed instruction, that's when you provide them these skill gaps are the ones that we're talking about, the student performing as compared to the general curriculum, as compared to state standards, all right? Again, the skill gap for PT or OT is integral in and not separate from the students functioning in the general curriculum and their as compared to state standards. Right? It's one of the reasons that if the student only has motor needs, but doesn't have needs for specially designed instruction, we can't serve them under IDEA. That's not an eligible student. Right? It's one of the reasons we can have students in wheelchairs that may not be IDEA eligible or other motor impairments. Did I answer the question, I hope? Let me get back to where I was as you're thinking about it. Okay. <clears throat> Goals for related services. Tucked back in 71 Federal Register on page 46662, there's this statement. The IDEA does not require goals to be written for each specific discipline. You say, what? Wait a minute. How do we know if the student is making progress in their physical therapy or making progress in their occupational therapy? You have to go back to the definition of related services. And it's this, you know, kind of non-exclusive list of services for the purpose of helping the child to benefit from their specially designed instruction. So there may be, for instance, a written language goal that an OT helps to implement in the form of OT assistance in order for the student to make progress on their written language goal. Because written language may be a need from the language perspective and also from the writing perspective, right? Same is true for physical therapy as well. Um, same is true for counseling. There's no requirement in IDEA that you would have a separate counseling goal because the educational need when it comes to counseling is to help the student to be successful in their specially designed instruction, meaning successful in being able to participate in and make progress in the general curriculum, right? So students may need uh, sensory input, they may need vestibular input, they may need calming, they may need all sorts of things in order to be successful 
on their specially designed instruction. That's where you came in, come in. It does not require a separate goal to be written for each discipline. It also doesn't prohibit it. So if your practice in your district, and I'm gonna to defer to your district here, if your district prefers that there be a, a goal for each discipline, then that's what you need to do. I just want you to know that it's not required. And the reason why it's not required, it helps you understand how closely tied related services are to benefiting from the specially designed instruction. Again, it's not parallel. Everything links to the specially designed instruction, which by the way, then links to the opportunity to participate in and progress in the general curriculum. So under the federal regulations, it doesn't require a separate goal. Once you have clearly identified the student's educational needs across all environments, all needs related to the student's disability, now you're ready to design and provide, uh, design measurable goals and provide services, okay? Let me say that those goals must link to the skill gaps. I once had a very, very, very kind special education teacher, uh, and this was a special education K-1 teacher who said, well, we don't like to focus on what the student can't do. So we don't really talk about that too much. We wanna focus in on building them up and what they can do. Well, if that's true, first of all, bless you, because that's pretty sweet. But second of all, that's a compliance problem because you have got to address skill deficits in an IEP. You have got to address skill gaps. If you don't, there's no way to measure progress. You've got to be descriptive about where the student is beginning, starting, their starting level, and where you expect them to be at the end of that IEP, right? So we are talking about skill gaps. We are talking about measurable goals. And then we are talking about providing services to help students meet those measurable goals. Again, goals are rigorous, but reasonable. Rigorous meaning targeted and unique for each student. Reasonable meaning attainable within a year. So now I've got another visual for you. And this visual is about services and it's a depiction of what I've been telling you over the last few minutes. First of all, look at the center of the circle. It's the general curriculum. Because but for one or 2% of students in the universe of special education students are going to be working towards the general curriculum, right? Could be a downward extension, a slight downward extension, a bigger downward extension. But your goal is always close that skill gap to get the students successful in the general curriculum. Income special education supports, specially designed instruction, because that's the definition of special education. It's a long definition, but you will see the words specially designed instruction. Special education comes in and wraps around the general curriculum because by definition in 300.39, the purpose of specially designed instruction is to help the student participate in and progress in the general curriculum be successful in the general curriculum, right? And now related services come in and wrap around special education. Why doesn't it wrap around the general curriculum? Because you can't get a related service if you don't need specially designed instruction. And because the definition is different. Related services in 300.34 is designed as the services and supports that are provided to help a student benefit from their specially designed instruction, which in this graphic is the blue circle. If you help them benefit from their specially designed instruction and the specially designed instruction helps them to progress in and be successful in the general curriculum, you've nailed it. That is FAPE delivered in the LRE, okay? And then we bring in supplementary aids and services, which is mentioned uh, in the off to the side of the graphic here, because supplementary aids and services overlay all of this. Supplementary aids and services are provided to enable children with disabilities to be educated with non-disabled children to the maximum extent appropriate, okay? So there's one of our maximums right there. You are obligated, you have a responsibility, you have a duty, you have a mandate to provide supplementary aids and services to the extent appropriate 
to maximize the amount of time that students are educated with non-disabled children. Okay. And that's non-disabled children sitting in a classroom on any given day. Okay. Once you devise those services and you get the parents' consent to implement services for the initial IEP, after that, you're not seeking the parents' consent for implementation on an annual basis. But after, so initially you seek the parents' consent to provide those services. And then at the annual IEP, you don't have to re-seek consent. The parent has the right to revoke consent if at some point they change their mind, right? But once determined by the team, services must be provided in accordance with the IEP. There is no freestyling here. What that means is that special ed and related services, accommodations, modifications, supports for the student, everything is delivered in conformity with an IEP. And it says it in 300.17, which by the way, is one of the definitions of FAPE. Special education and related services provided in conformity with an IEP. Now, no single team member or provider is free to make unilateral changes to the amount, frequency, type, or duration of services, special ed or related services. Okay. When we did the school psychologist group, I had a, a psychologist ask me how much change would be a unilateral change. It is what it is and it means what it says. Services implemented consistent with the IEP, no unilateral changes, meaning that the parent must be involved in any decisions to change an IEP, right? It's either gonna be done at the annual team meeting with the parent participating or invited to participate, or it's gonna be done through amendment. And if it's an amendment, you must have the parent's agreement. If you can't find the parent, if you can't reach the parent, you cannot amend that IEP until you get the parent's agreement. We know that agreement is a little bit different than informed consent, but know that parents have the right to agree to any amendments before you implement the change. Okay. Lenora, so, we have a question. Okay, go right ahead. The question is, if a student receives articulation only speech services, does that mean that other related services cannot be provided? No, because in Wyoming, as I said in the beginning, if the student is speech only, that becomes their specially designed instruction. That is their special education. It's noted on the special education service page as opposed to the related service page. If a student is eligible in any other disability categories, that speech language by state rule automatically reverts to a related service. And then it goes on the related services page of the IEP in that section. So if a student is speech language only, and for instance, they have, oh, let me think of some good examples. Cause I, I initially was a little reluctant about this, but over the years I have been absolutely convinced that this is appropriate. So for instance, you might have a student who has a language impairment and part of it is they're very soft-spoken and they don't have the breath control to produce um, language in an appropriate way. And so the OT might come in or the PT might come in to help with positioning and diaphragm control and things like that in order to help the student to be able to produce more language. But again, the specially designed instruction is the speech language. The related service that wraps around it might be OT or PT to help the student to benefit from that specially designed instruction. So no, a student who receives speech language as the specially designed instruction, again, we're gonna serve based on need. And if the student needs related services in order to benefit from that specially designed instruction, they can get it if the team decides that that's necessary, right? Did that answer your question? I think some of it is um, if they have, if they're Arctic only 
and not ha- you know not a language impairment, but just articulation only. Um, mm-hmm. Does that still count? And do they still can they still receive related service with articulation only? I am going to answer it this way. It is harder to make the nexus for Arctic only. First of all, let me back way up. Arctic only students, you would have to say that that articulation error or that constellation of errors adversely affects a child's educational performance. Okay. If the team says, yes, this articulation error is of such a magnitude that it affects, adversely affects educational performance, then RTIC only could be the specially designed instruction. I got to tell you, that's a tough sell. It's not impossible, but articulation errors alone do not equate to adversely affecting a child's educational performance, just like disability alone does not equate to adversely affecting educational performance. The team would have to document how is it that that articulation error adversely affects educational performance and results in the need for specially designed instruction. If the team can do that, then the student crosses the threshold into special education eligibility. Their specially designed instruction is speech language in the area of articulation but we don't serve in silos. If the student has other educational needs that result from that disability, then yes, the IEP team would be charged with meeting those needs as well. So I go back to, um, and I'm not a speech language path, so forgive me if I'm totally butchering this. I'm just trying to think of an example here, but I think of a student who um, maybe uh, has articulation errors that might involve things like poor oral motor skills that would require Uh, the student now needs occupational therapy in order to benefit from their articulation specially designed instruction. Um, Another um, one might be, for instance, stuttering. If a student stutters, which is one of the eligibility uh, considerations on the speech language eligibility determination, uh, you have a student who stutters and it may be the result of poor breath control or something else there may be the um, need for related services in order to help that student to improve their breath control so that they can benefit from their specially designed instruction. But having said that, I will tell you that it's more attenuated. If a student is Arctic only, if a student is stuttering only, it is much more difficult to justify that the student needs related services in order to benefit from that specially designed instruction in articulation, okay? The other reason this becomes critical is where, as a country, not just as a state, but where do we provide the majority of these services, OT and PT, for an Arctic only kid? For the most part, we do it in a therapy room, which pulls the student out of the general curriculum And by the way, we create these curricular holes and then we assess students on it in district and statewide assessments on what they should have learned when they were out at PT or OT. So in order to justify removing the student from that environment, it must be linked to an educational need that results from the student's disability. It cannot be attenuated. It cannot be divorced. They have to be linked and it has to be a team decision. This is not a one person decision. All right. Did that help? We have time for another question. Okay. I think so. Yes. We do have another question. If you can take that right now. Sure. And I'm looking at it now. So I think it's can the can you have more than one area of specially designed instruction? The answer is a resounding yes. Okay. You would have specially designed instruction designed for the student in any area of educational need, um, when a student needs specially designed instruction, not just a related service. So you might have specially designed instruction in behavior. You might have specially designed instruction in academics. You might have specially designed instruction in social skills. You might have specially designed instruction in uh, functional skills because it's based on the unique needs of the student. And then, Correspondingly, you might have multiple related services to help the student to benefit 
from their specially designed instruction, right? And then the question was narrowed to if the student is a speech language student. My answer would be the same as it was just a moment ago. If the team determines that the student needs the assistance of PT and OT, or maybe PT and OT and counseling, or counseling, could be and, could be or, in order to benefit from their specially designed instruction in the area of language, speech language, then yes, they can get more than one related service. I don't know if a student is speech language only, then that is their specially designed instruction. I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question correctly, right? Oh, do you mean like academics? Okay, okay, now I'm getting it. Um, so sure, if a student has language impairments, that may very well spill over into their ability to progress, make progress and be successful in the general curriculum. Uh, language may very well interfere with reading. Language may very well interfere with writing. So yeah, it's possible. But again, the thing that I wanna emphasize is that this is based on a rock star comprehensive evaluation that is proposed and planned by a team and then based on everything you've learned about this student, you've determined the skill gaps as a team, and you've determined measurable annual goals as a team, and now you're going to determine services as a team. This is not one provider saying, I think I need to go in there and provide this. It's the team deciding it. Once it's in the IEP, you don't freestyle, and you deliver services consistent with that IEP. Right. At the end of this, it's all about educational benefit, right? If you are not documenting educational benefit, you have a problem as a team because teams make decisions, not individuals. You got to go back and find the broken link. So, um, In order to get that, there's one more stopping point and it's least restrictive environment. I said earlier that this bundle of services needs to be delivered in the LRE, okay? The LRE is a mandate. It's an absolute right for a student. So we are not free to change that standard, okay? The three maximums that are in the regulations are right here educated with non-disabled children to the maximum extent appropriate. Participate with non-disabled children in extracurricular activities to the maximum extent appropriate. Supplementary aids and services are provided to educate students with non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate. Because it's a maximizing standard, your analysis is different than what's reasonable. Your analysis is different than what might benefit the student. Your analysis as a team is all about how do we maximize the amount of time that this student spends with non-disabled peers, okay? It's an absolute must. The least restrictive environment continuum looks something like this. And so you are gonna probe this as a team. So to figure out what stopping point on this continuum is this student's least restrictive environment. So first of all, to the maximum extent appropriate, it's a regular classroom. A careful read of the LRE sections in 114 through 117, you will see the words regular classroom in there over and over again. So to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities are educated with non-disabled peers in regular classroom environments. It's one of the reasons that when you're determining how to provide related services, you take a close look at this maximum because if services can be provided in a regular education environment <clears throat> almost in I, i've heard the word authentic a lot lately and at the risk of overuse i'm going to use it one more time um, authentically in the classroom so helping a student on written language that's part of the curriculum and the expectation for all students <coughs> You'd have to consider that before you pull them out to the therapy room. 
excuse my cough. And then again, continuing on, only if regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be satisfactorily achieved, <coughs> do you move on to special classes? Okay, you do not get to special classes without considering regular classes with supplementary aids and services. So what supports can you put in that general classroom to help the child stay there? And only if no lesser restrictive option will work, could you ever have a conversation about separate schools and determine that that's the appropriate least restrictive placement for a student. And only if no lesser restrictive option would work, could you ever get to placement in a residential setting. And only if education with no peers is the only option, could you get to hospital or homebound. Homebound is considered the most restrictive placement because how many non-disabled peers do you have there? None, right? So hospital or homebound would be considered the most restrictive and you have to amass a lot of documentation for the notion that you must place a child with no other peers. You'd have to have a lot of behavioral documentation um, for, and, and we most frequently see this for students with out of control behavior. A great example, and I'll check my time here. I don't have um, too much time, but we can go through it. Great example is a case out of the Western District of Wisconsin. And in that case, there was a seven-year-old girl who had moved into the district for the first time. Parents had moved away from their home community where the student had lived in a hospital. She had not lived with her parents. Due to her violent behavior, she had been hospitalized pretty much her entire life. She had a significant severe mental health diagnosis of early onset schizophrenia, and she was violent, okay? Parents longed for normalcy for this child, wanted her to be a typical kid, moves her to Wisconsin, enrolls her in school without telling the school about where she had lived the majority of her life or what her needs were. That child appears in school and it is very quick when the school notices that this is not a typically developing child. This is an extremely violent child with high, high needs, right? So initially that it was clear they had to go into evaluation. So the School proposes an evaluation, but in the meantime, they're having trouble maintaining safety. This child is so violent. So they reduced expectations and focused their IEP on behavior only because until, they're, until they could get to behavior under control, they could not get to academics. So they're reevaluating this child while this is happening. They're focusing the IEP and the instruction on behavior not academics, and they still cannot maintain safety of this student or other students. So they move the child to a homebound setting for the purpose of conducting the evaluation. Court, the Western District of Wisconsin says, that's a, you could have survived that challenge, school district, because this student's behavior was so extreme, so violent, so unexpected, that you needed some time to conduct an evaluation safely in order to know how to program for her and what her least restrictive environment actually would be, okay? Staff people were going to the home to serve this child consistent with the homebound plan in the IEP. In a very quick amount of time, staff refused to go because they were getting injured because they didn't consider it safe. So then what ended up happening is the school district did nothing. They didn't complete the evaluation because she was too violent. They didn't serve her in homebound because she was too violent. And that's where the court took a very disparaging view of the school district and said, we are not telling you, you have to allow that child to sit in a general classroom and injure others or herself. But what we are telling her you is that you cannot reject this child because she's high needs. You would have had an obligation to hospitalize her, to get a team of people evaluating her to know what services and supports that she needs. You can't say, we can't do it. And that is really one of the best examples along with the Timothy W case, which is the no reject principle. You cannot reject students for any reason in special education. You must educate them. You must figure out how to educate them 
to a manner that is appropriate based on that student's unique needs, to a level that's appropriate based on that student's unique needs. So I don't want to suggest that homebound can be the first setting while you're figuring it out. It can't. Only in the most extreme circumstances is homebound appropriate. Now with the COVID overlay, I want to tell you that COVID students educated virtually at home because of health concerns, that's not a homebound placement. A homebound placement is based on the skill gaps and needs that you have identified. It is the only option on the LRE continuum. No peers is the only option based on the student's educational needs, not this COVID overlay, okay? Because students could be exposed to the general curriculum to the same degree by participating virtually, particularly in school districts that offer a choice between resumption of in-person instruction or virtual services. So don't think that educating kids at home virtually for the purpose of COVID restrictions means homebound. It's not the same thing. Okay, so keep the team's focus on educational benefit. Let me back up. You've got this rock star comprehensive evaluation that clearly delineates the student's educational needs and present levels. And now you have uh, drafted measurable goals that are rigorous but reasonable to close those skill gaps associated with the present levels. And then you've designed a bundle of services to be delivered in the LRE to help the student achieve success on those measurable goals and success in the general curriculum. And now you must monitor educational benefit. This is the school district's responsibility to propose an IEP reasonably calculated to provide educational benefit in light of the student's circumstance. Students have the right to receive this and parents have the right to challenge you if they don't believe the school is providing that. Despite these corresponding duties and rights, there's still no guarantee of success, okay? This reciprocal responsibility right scenario is not a guarantee of success. Lack of educational benefit means the team has more work to do. Don't wait months to do it, okay? Months is too long. When you have the initial inkling that the services that the team has designed, proposed, and implemented are not resulting in the educational benefit that you anticipated, you've got to go back in and find the broken link. How will you know if it's working? You're gonna be progress monitoring, right? The team is going to monitor the student's progress. The team is gonna collect and share data at a high frequency. And let me tell you, if you have a lack of progress, that is a time to lean in, collect more data, not less. Share at a higher frequency, not a lower one. Figure out what's happening if you have less than the anticipated progress. So your progress monitoring towards IEP goals and, your prog and the progress in the general curriculum. You're doing both. Right? Stay vigilant and communicate with parents more, not less. What is a reasonable amount of progress? Anyone? You've, the team has already determined this. Where have they determined it? Take a guess. Tell me what is a reasonable amount of progress? This isn't a guess. The team has already determined this by developing Oh, let me see if it's Yes, by developing rigorous but reasonable measurable annual goals. The team has already said, so thank you who said that, whoever said that. Uh, the team has already said what is reasonable to expect over the course of this annual IEP. If the student is not meeting with that expectation, you got work to do. So this rigorous but reasonable expectation is set out in the measurable goals. Rigorous meaning challenging, targeted, unique, and reasonable meaning how much of this skill gap can we expect to close in one year, right? So you know what to do on lack of progress and you must document this, document, document, document. It's the four R's. What happens if a student makes no or little progress? You get back in there and you figure it out. Who does this? The team. This is not one person. This is the team. 
Now, it may not necessarily be the team at the sitting at the same table, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, but it's the team communicating, figuring this out. When a reasonable amount of time after the team initially realizes that you have little or no progress. And I'm not talking months here, I'm talking less than that. Why? Because if you don't recalibrate the IEP at this point, a denial of FAPE will most assuredly result. Okay, if you sit on a lack of progress, you got a problem. So what do you do? You reconvene the team, get them communicating. May not necessarily be face-to-face -face in the same room, but you are communicating. You're reconvening the communication of this team. You're reviewing every aspect of the IEP and going back and finding that broken link, okay? You review, did we not have a clear understanding of the student's current educational needs? Do we need to go back to comprehensive evaluation? Uh, do we have a, a clear understanding of the student's present levels? Have they changed? Did we implement measurable goals? Did we provide services consistent with the IP? You're reviewing every aspect of this IEP. And once you've done that, now you can re-strategize and say, okay, maybe we need to layer in more services or we need to change the services or we need to add more supports. And once you've re-strategized as a team, now you're going to revise the IEP, but in that order, okay? What happens with unexpected progress, meaning that the arrow is going up faster than you anticipated as a team. The four R's as a team. Okay, so that's the who. When it's a reasonable amount of time. So when the student makes unexpected progress and like nails a goal way before you think they should, a reasonable amount of time after that, you need to Engage in the four R's. Why? Because a denial of FAPE will result if you don't recalibrate. Why would it be a denial of FAPE if the child is making lots of progress? Because at that level of attainment, if you don't change something, the student's gonna plateau. You wanna keep closing that skill gap. You have to have something in the IEP to keep closing that skill gap. And until and unless that skill gap is completely closed, at an independent level, you must keep engaging in the four R's when you have unexpected or unanticipated progress. Anytime the educational needs change, it is time to realign the IEP to address new educational needs in order to provide access and an opportunity to progress in the general curriculum. So you're going to go through the four R's over and over again. You're gonna puzzle backward through that FAPE continuum to say, where is the broken link? It's absolutely critical that that be documented in the team's record. So again, reconvene, get the team together, virtually, telephonically, at the same table, doesn't matter, just get them talking. Unless it's the annual IP, then it needs to be at the team table, right? Ask what additional information is needed to fully understand the student's current educational needs and then develop a plan to gather information or conduct additional assessments if that's what you need in order to answer that question. And then set a time to review the new information, right? So your reconvening is all about getting the team talking, asking questions, probing. You're going back through this FAPE continuum to find the broken link again and again. So review all aspects of it. Review all information collected, probe, probe, probe. The goal here is a clear understanding of the student's current functioning. Did it change? Was the lack of progress because we failed to implement something? Was the unanticipated progress because we shot too low the first time? And then from there, have the present levels changed? What, where, excuse me, were the goals rigorous and reasonable? If not, you got to recalibrate. Were services provided consistent with the IEP? And then you head into this re-strategizing where you're recalibrating what the student needs and how you're going to meet those needs and what special education and related services and supplementary aids and services you're going to provide for that child and program modifications and supports to advance 
towards attaining the annual goal, to be involved in and make progress in the general education curriculum, and to participate with other children without, with disabilities and non-disabled children in the activities described above. So again, this non-disabled peers maximizing the amount of time. So you're gonna re-strategize what is the LRE in which the student can be successful. Understand the difference between location and placement. Placement is that bundle of services delivered in the LRE. The location might be the specific classroom or therapy room that you take them to but you only get to take them there if you've identified placement in a separate classroom for a part of the student's day. If you have identified the LRE as the general classroom for the entirety of the day, you are not free to remove that student. After you've re-strategized and recalibrated, now you revise the IEP to meet the student's current educational needs. Could be at the annual meeting, could be at an amendment if it's in between. Then you set out to provide services and supports in conformity with the IEP or the amended IEP. You go back through, collect and report frequent progress data. And if the student's not receiving, receiving the anticipated educational benefits, you go back again to the four R's. That must be evidenced in the student's file in order to withstand a challenge. And by the way, it's what you wanna do because this is how you improve outcomes for kids with disabilities because we work on behalf of children. And if that doesn't convince you, you know, maybe the case law about it would. And there's a lot of different cases that provide uh, all sorts of remedies when the team doesn't do this, okay? So this was a young person um, about an, waiting until the student entered kindergarten to conduct an IDEA evaluation and, um, and the student, it was a reevaluation. The student was in preschool services, um, was not doing well. And the school district wanted to wait until their, the student entered kindergarten. Well, guess what? It resulted in a whole year of missed services and the hearing officer awarded over 900 hours in compensatory education, right? because the student missed essentially a whole year of services during a critical developmental stage. So the stakes are high here. This case is out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and um, the district delayed evaluating an elementary student who struggled with reading comprehension and failed to develop an adequate IEP for that student. The student had a 504 plan but was not was not making progress on the 504 plan, was not successful. That should be a huge red flag that you have a mature child find obligation in IDEA when a student is not successful on a 504 plan. In this case, the delay was unreasonable and denied the student fate, okay? Here's a, a case out of the Central District of California. It may be difficult to develop an appropriate educational program, especially if the student requires intensive services to address his behaviors and deficits. Okay. If a student is not successful, the district should promptly modify the IEP if it's not meeting the student's needs in either direction. In this case, the a student had um, 314 minutes per day of group instruction, but this student could not tolerate it. So the team had an obligation to recalibrate Re, you know, reconvene, review, recalibrate, and find out what's happening. Why is the student not being successful? What do we need to change? What are their current educational needs? 314 minutes may have worked the year prior, but it's not working this year. And then revise that IEP. And so the district had to then um, move the student to a much smaller environment, a more restrictive environment based on the student's educational needs. So this is not one directional. It's bi-directional. You must move the LRE continuum. What is the least restrictive placement based on the student's needs? And you may need to go up it or down it based on the current educational needs of the student. Um, the same is true for you know, bi-directional progress. Too much progress, not enough progress. You still got to engage in the four R's. Eastern District of Pennsylvania, um, this is a reimbursement case. Uh, reimbursement cases tend to be very expensive. 
uh, this student was a student with autism and the um, the state did not have a general education preschool um, and did not consider a community preschool placement. Um, this did, they could not justify why the student's time with non-disabled peers wasn't maximized. So in this case, the student was entitled to tuition reimbursement because of an LRE violation at the preschool level. And this case is really a COVID case. It's out of the District Court of New Mexico. And um, the students, is, this is an elementary student and they developed inadequate IEPs and they failed to ensure the student received appropriate instruction in reading and writing. They kept substantially the same goals for three years despite lack of progress, okay? Um, earlier I said, this is a COVID case. This is not, this is a different New Mexico case. This is a stagnant progress case. The district did not respond to lack of progress in any kind of timely way, and the reward was big. Okay, so the um, also the methodology kept crept into this case because the district didn't react to a lack of progress when the parents seek them private school services from an Orton Gillingham school that may cost lots and lots of money. Um, this parent would be entitled to reimbursement for the full amount based on the denial of FAPE. And this one out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. This is a student with autism and speech language impairment. And the team repeats goals from one year to the other, despite documenting progress, huge red flag. And the courts take a very dim view of this. So the, the goals they needed to engage in the four R's. They needed to reconvene, review, re-strategize, and revise. Team didn't do that. And so there was a finding of denial of FAPE and tuition reimbursement. This one out of the District Court of Maryland, elementary school student, they did not conduct the functional behavioral assessment in a timely manner. And they developed an IEP that failed to address the interfering behaviors, okay? Behaviors can be the most challenging thing, um, but it, don't treat it any differently than academics. If you have a behavior disorder that is interfering with learning, interfering with that student's learning or the learning of others, you must address it in the IEP. And you have to lean in and take very uh, close look at the data that tells you whether you're being successful in remediating that behavior, changing it. If the student does not have progress, you gotta get back in there really quick. Look at this amount of time that not only did the district in this case wait six months to conduct the FBA, but the interventions it offered had no meaningful impact on the child's educational behavior. Don't wait months. Months will be too long in the event of a court challenge. In this case, the district classifies an IDEA eligible student, um, regardless of how it classified it. In this case, the district misclassified the student. Regardless of how the student is classified, the district must evaluate the student in all suspected areas of disability and must develop an IEP that addresses all educational needs, right? So this student's evaluations revealed ongoing struggles with reading. The district repeatedly developed IEPs that focused primarily on students with autism. The oversight, along with repetition of goals that resulted in little or no progress, this was a huge tuition reimbursement award for a private reading program. So I see a couple other questions. Um, I don't know how far back to go. Dina, have you been monitoring that? You got, let's I see. have. What am I missing? Yeah. So there's just a couple more questions that I've seen. Um, one of them deals with, hold on one second, assessing in a native language. And it says, what are the recommendations when there is no access to an interpreter and parent and parent does not have sufficient language to assist in the evaluation? Yeah, first of all, the parent would never be an appropriate interpreter for the purposes of conducting an evaluation. Um, you know, parents present alone could, could affect um, the outcome of the evaluation. Parents are not qualified interpreters. Um, for the most part, I can't say that in every case, 
but even if the parent is a qualified interpreter, they wouldn't interpret for their own child during an assessment. So my blanket response there, it, it, it would be very difficult to justify ever using a parent as an interpreter in an assessment or evaluation situation. It could significantly impact the outcome of the evaluation. Um, and then my second response, don't be offended when I say this, is that it doesn't matter if it's difficult. It is an absolute requirement that you evaluate a student in a native language if need be. And that means you have to do it. That means if you need to talk to your director, your director needs to talk to the state, whatever it might be, um, there are some, you know, you can share resources with other districts. You can pull resources in from the private sector. You can pull resources in from other states if you need to. But the bottom line is you cannot miss the step of assessing the student in their native language if that's necessary. Another question? And there is. Does, what about when a child is not making progress due to their attendance, especially when they are receiving services in the preschool setting that is not mandated by the state? Yeah, so my answer would be the same whether it's preschool or high school. If you have a student who has poor attendance, that is a behavior that's interfering with learning and you need to figure out what's happening there and develop strategies to remediate that behavior, to change it, to close that behavioral skill gap. Um, so this is where uh, truancy at the senior high level, um, absences at, at the preschool level would all be treated the same. Get in there and find out why is the student frequently absent and what supports and services can be put in place to help the student's attendance improve. Same answer. Right? It's a behavior that interferes with learning. If you ignore it or if you rely on the parent alone to remediate it, you have a fake problem. All right. What else did I miss, Tina? Um, there's just a person asking if anyone in the state speaks Burmese dialect. Mm -hmm. Can't help you there. One thing I wanna say though about um, service provider logs, and, and I raised this now because again, I ha we had a case this morning that was just spot on. Service provider logs, especially if you're itinerant, meaning you travel between school buildings, uh, you travel, um, you know, you are not stationary in a classroom and there for six hours and you're, you're moving in and out of service delivery situations. You want to make sure that you keep service logs. Um, the IDEA doesn't specifically mandate them, but when it comes time, if there's a challenge to services being implemented consistent with the IEP, service logs kept in real time are the most powerful way to demonstrate that services are provided consistent with the IEP. They need to be contemporaneous, meaning kept in real time, and they need to be reliable authentic. They need to be honest in order for courts to be able to give them any weight. So if you as an OT or PT or behavior intervention specialist are traveling around to different students, different buildings, develop a system that allows you to keep real-time service logs. It will help you in the long run in the event of a challenge. Anything else before we part? Um, any other questions? Uh, let's see here. Now's your time. Yes, we do have. It says, please talk about the requirements for related services to document. Oh, sorry, I scrolled too quickly. Um, please talk about the requirements for related services to document services provided not in the IEP as far as the provider service log. There's, they actually have a few questions in this. This group, there's a group. I'm not them. sure what that means. So somebody's going to have to help. I mean, related service providers are only going to provide services consistent with the IEP. And then you're going to document that. Does someone, from that, group, does someone want, from that group want to unmute and ask your question? Please. Yes. Thank you. Um, we're asking. Um, what are the requirements for us to document our service time, what we're doing in our, in our sessions with students? Um, what does IDEA or state law say about what we should be putting in our service log as we don't have a lot of specific information on what that should include? 
just for our records to say we provided that service. Sure. So just to reinforce, this is not an, an IDEA issue. The IDEA doesn't specifically talk about service logs. There are other federal laws like GEPA that requires sufficient record keeping to um, support funding. So sometimes service logs get lumped in under there. I, I don't really care about GEPA because I'm more focused on getting kids needs met. But here's the deal. In the event of a challenge, you have to be able to say services were provided consistent with the IEP. And the more accurate logs in real time that you keep, you can head off a disagreement about that. If the parent starts wondering, is my child, they're not talking about OT anymore. Is the child not receiving the service anymore? When you keep accurate records about the date of the service, the type of service, some general description of what occurred during this service time on this particular date, and also some notation about where the service occurred, the location of the service, because that will tell you whether it was consistent with the LRE that the team determined for the student. Um, that would be very, very helpful to you uh, in the event of a challenge or even in the event of a disagreement with the parent or or some question by the parent about whether services are being provided. Because I'll tell you, implementation issues start tiny. The, those disagreements start really tiny with, I'm not sure my kid's getting all their services. And, and if a parent asks that question or starts asking questions about services, being able to lay that out and say, yep, here they are, or providing those um, in advance as part of your progress monitoring could be incredibly helpful in, in sort of fighting off any disputes before they even start. But this isn't state law says service logs need to contain this or state law or federal law says service logs need to contain this. The only exception to that is if your district is engaging in third party billing for the purposes of reimbursement from public or private insurance, you must keep sufficient information to justify uh, the service according to the IEP. Um, so I don't have one answer for that. It's really going to depend. But I will say, as a general rule, more is better. Contemporaneous is a must. If it's not contemporaneously kept in real time, courts are going to completely discount it. In fact, the court today, the case we were using, used the term irrelevant. The service provider logs were irrelevant because they were not kept in real time. Right? Other questions that I missed this, on the phone? This group had two more questions. Okay. You wanna, um, I don't know if you want to go ahead and unmute. You're welcome to do so. Sure. Um, the second question we have was about our obligation to students on a 504 plan. We understand that they're not special ed students, but often we're part of the process as far as brainstorming for accommodations or other things. So please tell us. Um, if there are some suggestions or guidelines that we can use um, to kind of help us understand where we are as OTs at fitting in with these students. Um, because there are situations where we're saying, you know, we are exclusive to special education students only. So how would that fit with kind of our duties as school-based OTs? Right. So um, this response is going to be twofold. One is it's going to be based on student needs as determined by the 504 team rather than the IEP team. And by the way, 504 plans are not just about accommodations. Uh, students on 504 plans also have a right to receive FAPE um, and they can receive related services in order to be able to help them to benefit from FAPE and their education. So it is about student benefit as determined by the 504 team, not an IEP team, obviously, because this is a 504 student, not a special ed student. However, this is where it gets a little tricky and would warrant conversations with higher up. If you are providing services to non-IDEA eligible students, you've got a, a time and effort situation because those services provided to 504 students are not reimbursable under Part B. They may be, uh, they may not be reimbursable under state funds, but I don't know. I cannot definitively answer that. I can definitively answer Part B special education funds cannot be used to provide services to non-special education stu services, students, excuse me. Um, somebody 
at the state level would need to definitively answer the question about whether any state funds could be used to provide 504 plan services. Um, but anytime you are providing services to non-IDEA eligible students, uh, you must keep a time and effort log so that a proportion of your salary then may be reimbursable through IDEA Part B funds, special education funds, and the other portion is not. So it's not an easy answer. Uh, yes, it could and should happen because students on 504 plans are entitled to receive um, related services as well as IDEA students. You just can't use the same pot of money. And so you may not be able to use the same staff or you may not be able to pay the staff, same staff person out of the same pots of money. Okay, I hope I answered that. And then the third question. All right, our third question is about um, writing class. Um, often we do um, discipline specific sections within our plat. We're wondering if um, that's an okay practice or if it's preferred to be writing a cumulative plat altogether. Um, well, you, you're going to get my um, thoughts here as a professional that has reviewed thousands and thousands of IEPs over the course of my career. I think it is much more meaningful to talk about the whole student um, because there may be behavior triggers like work that's too difficult in the academic realm that triggers a student um, and their inappropriate behavior. I don't see discipline as an educational need or a present level. I see behavior as an educational need, and you would want to have specific articulated information about the student's behavioral level of performance. How are they performing behaviorally across environments? So in my mind, talking about the whole child is a far better practice. This is true generally, not just about behavior. Um, and I think the practice of writing discipline specific present levels, um, maybe is maybe you're saying the same thing, but I think the language, choosing your language carefully and intentionally, you're talking about behavior, not discipline. Sometimes behavior results in discipline, but you'd want to talk about behavior needs of the student so that you can uh, have behavioral progress, so it doesn't result in discipline. It doesn't result in removals. Sure. So I'm I would. Sorry. I think maybe there's a misunderstanding. Discipline specific meant like OT section. Oh, a oh, my bad. Okay, yeah, got it. My bad. I went straight to behavior there, um, because this is about behavior intervention specialist too. Um, so yeah, again, same front part of the answer. I think it's far better to describe the student as the whole child across environments, across settings, um, weaving in when, uh, for instance, becoming overstimulated may interfere with their academics and things like that. So you're not separating those out. We're not looking at pieces of a child. We're looking at a whole child. That's how we get really rock solid IEPs that result in benefit for students. That's how we improve outcomes for kids with disabilities. It's not a compliance issue, but, how do we want to have the best opportunity to impact and improve outcomes for students with disabilities? Look at the whole child. Teamwork, because these decisions are made by teams. All right, sorry I missed that point. Any other questions? I think we've pretty much used up all of our time here. Oh, two minutes more. Thank you, thank you for staying two extra minutes. Um, I thank you for your questions, your participation. And um, yeah, great group today. Thank you again. Lenore, we just wanna thank you for all of your knowledge and expertise. You have, you never disappoint and you always help us to come away with a much clearer picture of what IDEA should look like. So